Hey, what's going on, everyone? Uh, we are back for another episode of the NML Pickleball Podcast. I am Chris Ross, and I am with Jeremy Comazetto. It's been it's been a little over a couple of weeks, actually. Now I think, Jer, uh, how are you doing? Doing pretty well, thanks. We've definitely been slacking on the podcast. Yeah, it's been a little bit of a break in the in the pro pickleball world, at least in terms of tournaments. So we've we've uh, we've taken a little bit of a break uh, as well from the podcast and some blogging with some some bigger news that's come up that we haven't really covered. So you're uh, just a holiday guy, eh? You're in Europe, and then the pros are on a break, so you're taking another break. Must be nice. Must be nice. It's a uh, it's a t- it's a two man operation if uh, if you weren't uh, if you weren't aware of that. But uh, I'll I'll leave that for another day maybe. Thought it was the three man operation. Well, yeah, three person operation if you want to be if you want to be accurate. Producer Alyssa didn't get her enough credit here. Uh, <laughs> so we uh, we've. We missed a, a little bit of stuff here. I guess we should actually, we got to start with our sponsors, Jer. Uh, so we have, uh, well, I've got my Drop Shot District hoodie on. You're you're dressed like a businessman, but you do have my a Drop, drop Shot, shot uh, coffee mug, though, having my little cup of joe. Yeah, so P- Drop Shot District, for people who don't know, it's a, it's a pickleball lifestyle brand. Again, they've got lots of different stuff, cool merch, uh, apparel, all that sort of thing. Uh, and you can go to their website, dropshotdistrict.com, and you can use our discount code NML10TEN uh, for a little bit of a discount off your purchase. Uh, we've also got One Shot Pickleball, which is uh, One Shot's our paddle and uh, pickleball athletic apparel sponsor. One Shot, they've got great paddles. We've been using them since... Well, you've been using them since 2019. I've been using them for the last couple of years now. Uh, and their new Infinity Shot paddles, I, I'm really liking, and I think you are as well. I love the Infinity Shot. Yeah, it's uh, it's a really good paddle. I, I know it's not probably as well known out there for, for paddle brands. But again, they're local Pacific Northwest and great family, and, and they do really good stuff. Uh, there's a lot of paddles out there on the market. But uh, you, you can go to One Shot Pickleball. Uh, his website and uh, use the code. We still got to get our discount code, Jer, but it's Ross1010 uh, for, for that discount code to have a little discount off your, your purchase there. So, so Jared, we, we've got to start today, I think, with the, we, a number of people have asked us why we haven't covered it yet, but we've, we've got to start with the MLP news, which is that uh, Steve Kuhn, uh, this is now Ooh, I don't know how a week and a half ago, maybe, or almost two weeks ago. Probably two weeks. Yeah, where Steve Kuhn, uh, it was uh, it was announced initially by uh, Jimmy Miller that he had resigned from his uh, spot uh, with MLP, and he was he was out at an MLP, uh, and you know it came out later that he he sent an email around to to the owners and, and other key players, essentially apologizing for for his actions that led to him resigning. Uh, pretty big, pretty big surprise that, I don't know if it's a surprise, but it's pretty big news when the guy who starts MLP is no longer with MLP less than two years after their first event. Yeah, I don't think it's been any like mystery or uh, anything that uh, Kuhn and Dundon have not gotten along since um, Dundon kind of got involved in the pickleball game. And it almost seemed inevitable that one of them at least was going to end up out of like things at with when the merger happened. And it looks like that is going to be coon in this case um and yeah so i don't know if it was shocking it's still a little unclear exactly what coon did to you know get the like basically resign but it seems that he was maybe trying to kind of sabotage the merger which on that note what i actually did find interesting is that was seemed fairly apparent that leaks of what was going on with Kuhn and things were coming from the PPA, it seems like. I don't know if you got that impression at all. 
Yeah, it, it did seem that way. And it also sounds like there's some information when all that was happening that didn't, like there was stuff that didn't quite come out that was leaked and was hopefully, I, I it seemed like that they were hoping would come out. And I, I mean, what's obviously interesting about that is because we've, we've got this apparent merger and they're still trying to come to terms. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a sign that maybe, you know, not just Kuhn, but other people on PPA's side weren't super happy with, with the merger and may, may not have been looking for it to go through. I mean, that's, that's really just sort of speculating there, but it's, uh, it, does, it does seem that way. Yeah, it certainly seems that way, and it is interesting to me, and then it also remains interesting to me that they're staying as kind of two different entities, even if they do get this merger done, which just seems to me like, I don't know, it's, I don't quite understand the point of it, like having two competing almost entities that don't seem to get along. Yeah, do do we know for sure? I know they announced that was going to happen, but do we know for sure that that is going to happen? Like the two entities sort yeah. of thing? Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, by all accounts, it sounds like the plan is to have a PPA tour next year and a major and an MLP. That I, I don't think we've heard anything else other than that. No, no, I don't think we have. And yeah, and I, I think what had been has been reported by others is that Kuhn was looking to try to raise additional capital by selling teams and, and other owners like that. He didn't have the support that he thought he would have. And then he said something to effect in his email that his, his emotions sort of got the best of him. And I, I think, you know, I've, I've always been uh, a fan of what Steve Kuhn has been about. I think he's, he seems like, you know, a good hearted person who, you know, has, had big plans for pickleball and I think it is just it's it's a loss I think for pickleball that he's not going to be around I I don't know if he was the best person I I just I really just don't know if he was the best person to to steer the ship uh with all that has gone on because I think what what happened you know with him starting this he had he had this idea for this different product this completely new concept but then then there's a bunch of business stuff that came up in terms of the competition with the PPA that really changed how they had to, how they had to act like, an, or how they had to do business a number of times. And, and that's, I, you know, and I, I don't know if they were making the right moves, you know, every step of the way or being prepared at each step for what the PPA was, was, was doing, you know, uh, and, and what plans they had for, for their vision for the sport. Yeah, and I think it was it became very apparent. It was reported from the start that basically MLP made this move with signing players without an actual solid plan or even all the owners being on board. And so I think the end result was despite them maybe appearing to kind of have won with player signings, I use that in quotations, they didn't have a final strategy. And also, I think not all the owners were on board. So it left them in a kind of cash crunch, it seems like. And also, with kind of a lack of direction, I felt like heading into this merger, which it, so it's still odd that MLP seemed to move first on this, but they didn't actually have a plan for where they wanted to end up. And that I think is now why we're in the situation we are. Well, isn't that, I, I mean, this time they acted first, but in the past, eh, you know, with, with Kuhn sort of, with Kuhn at the helm, they, they didn't have, they, they at least didn't anticipate what the future issues that would potentially arise. And, and it seems that each step of the way, there was more reactive rather than, proactive moves and I know this one was proactive but then it became reactive when the PPA started signing people for big money signing the tennis players but you look like they they start the league then the PPA does exclusive contracts and so it's like oh oh my goodness do we have a league can we run an MLP league we need to get owners they run the league it actually goes pretty well they start getting celebrity owners like more of them LeBron uh, Kevin Durant and then the PPA goes, okay, we're going to start our own pickleball league. They sign JW and Dylan. 
And, and then there's another, we got to react again. And, you know, then we're, we're in this spot this time. They're like, okay, we're going to take the bull by the horns, but I, I don't know if there was a full, full plan in place. It doesn't look like they're, they're, well, at least that this, that the PPA's moves were anticipated here. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I still wonder if the PPA or not the PPA MLP got too caught up still in trying to collect every them all in with respect to celebrity owners. It seemed like the gotta, vast gotta catch them all. That's what it is. Not a Pokemon guy, but tried to reference it anyways. Um, but like, yeah, they tried to like they got seemed to always be working on getting celebrity owners but after a point i felt like that was diminishing returns and maybe there was other things on both the business front and pickleball front that they should have been focusing on more yeah and i i think just what it ended like it put them in bad spots and and they they were kind of in a good spot here but they again i i just don't think they were quite ready for what what the ppa's counter move was i i don't i think the ppa you know, made some good counter moves. They put themselves in a good position here. I, I'm curious, actually, what you think, because it was, I think Tyler Loon brought it up just as a question on their podcast that, you know, why is there a double standard between how, how the public has treated MLP in, you know, breaking the term sheet here? And if the PPA had done that, you know, the PPA is getting eviscerated for that. You know, is that is that a double standard? It probably is. I think it goes back to like the long-term perception. You kind of earn your reputation a bit. The PPA hasn't made friends with a lot of the fans and a lot of the players. And that's why they got that where the MLP overall, a lot of fans have appreciated it and a lot of the newer players have appreciated it. So I think it bought them a little bit more uh, credit, though, again, when we look at this um, kind of merger here, I do wonder if MLP hasn't burnt, like the owners haven't burnt a lot of their credit with a lot of the players when it comes to contracts. Yeah, and I think we'll see. Uh -huh. they, there's still a lot to be sorted out, or I, I don't, again, they might have sorted out some of these things, but it seems like there, there's stuff that has to at least be announced in terms of how, you know, the MLP and PPA players are going to play these events and they're going to do things jointly. And, you know, you know, people signed under the impression they were just playing PPA or just playing MLP. So what that looks like and what the players have to do, uh, you know, I, I don't know what that means for the players and how they're going to feel about having to split their time in whatever manner is being know presented to them as well yeah i think there's a lot up in the air you know and i think that that's why also a lot of this is wait and see coons out but what's going to happen is the merger going through and what does next year look like there's a lot of questions and i still think of course the question is just money you know they're paying a lot of money they've got to be sorted out in terms of being able to pay all these players, pay for their events, pay for their employees. And it's been reported that NLP needs to be debt free by the end of the year in order to make all this work, which is why they're doing it in Dallas. And uh, they're uh, going before nationals, able to use that venue. And they're, they're doing other things to cut costs so they can be in that position before the end of the year. But, you know, still making money in, 2024 is, uh, you know, especially for an MLP style event where you don't have amateurs, uh, you know, helping to at least subsidize part of your costs. That doesn't, again, that didn't make the PPA overall profitable, but from that side of the events, they, they at least were able to subsidize some of their costs and, and MLP, you know, they, they, they've got to be reliant on sponsors and, uh, sponsors and more money coming in that way which and fans tuning in which still is a slow burn for pro pickleball yeah i think all these things are money losing like ppa can call themselves profitable or could but that's really tying in pickleball brackets pickleball tournaments and pickleball central so like if you don't have those auxiliary businesses 
you're not at a break even right now is the reality of the sport. Yeah, it's been said too many times that the PBA is profitable. I think we're pretty confident the, the PPA tour itself is not profitable currently as, as it runs. It's profitable overall in terms of all the businesses. But the actual like PPA tour pro events it is not uh, a money-making business. Yes. Any other thoughts on on? Career? No, I think it needs a lot of wait and see. And I think a lot of this is actually just kind of been hashed out, but we don't know. Yeah, when, you know, we've got, we actually do have pickleball that's going to be played. MLP is still moving ahead. They've got Dallas. We've got Dallas coming up and they, they announced their the group stage draws uh, a few weeks ago, or not a few weeks ago, I guess a couple weeks or last week, maybe. Uh, but anyway, I figured we, we got to talk about that and uh, go through them. I know, I don't know if you've spent that much time after, after the draws came out, but uh, there's, I think there's going to be, again, I, I, I still think the MLP stuff is super interesting. I, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be looking forward to watching. Uh, so we've got some premier, I've got them up here. Uh, so group A, Orlando Squeeze, Chicago Slice, Arizona Drive. Texas Ranchers. Yeah, it's an interesting group. It's obviously decently loaded. You've got the squeeze here, the championships, and then champions. And then you've got uh, Ben Johns and the slice, which is kind of what seems like defective team, but it is still Ben Johns. Um, Arizona's interesting Texas probably had a disappointing first event, and can they turn it around? Yeah, I, I think this is clearly. I think that this is clearly group of death for this event. You've got three playoff teams and a Texas team that had Lauren Stratman coming in. Was she going to play? Was she not going to play? Dylan Fraser was sick apparently for that event. I I um I don't exactly know or think. I have the best gauge on this group. I think Chicago, while flawed, they just need their women to come up with a game at an important game. Like they just need to come up with a game or two and and they'll get wins. I, I don't know if uh, I don't expect Eric Lang and Lacey Schneeman to really get it done, but their women were also close to winning a couple of matches that they didn't win. And I, I think I didn't, that, that, I didn't think I think Lacey's an inconsistent player, and I didn't think she had her best level at the first event. I don't know if you disagree, but I, I don't disagree at all. I don't think that was her her best level at all. And and I, I think, think she's the swing player for them. If she can get bring her highest level, which we've seen at times, can be very good. They suddenly become a pretty scary team. She still is missing more than uh, you want a player in her position to be at the premier level. And I think that continues to be a problem. But Ben, and, and you know, Ben was close to losing a couple matches. He was very close in uh, that Miami quarterfinal to losing the men's match. So, you know, maybe you can't guarantee that he's going to go undefeated. But if their women can just get a match or two. I, I'd be scared of this team. Orlando may have overperformed. Arizona may have overperformed. Arizona, their men went undefeated. They look pretty good in doing it. But again, there's always close matches here or there that can go either way. Yeah, I, I think the Squeeze are a solid team. I think they, I, I felt like they outperformed um, their, like, standing like where they probably did like i would be surprised not shocked if they repeat you're banking on kind of a continued ascension for, by um rachel Rohrbacher, but they're solid they're the, i think they're the most likely to like i'd be surprised if the squeeze don't get out of this group like yeah, I, I'd probably say the squeeze and the slice. I, I initially thought Arizona, and then I watched some more of the sleep, the slice matches since that group, uh, the group announcements were made. And I think, 
I, I like the slice to just pull out a couple of non Ben matches and, and that changes I, their whole dynamic. Yeah. And I think if you're Arizona, you took Vivian Glosman expecting her to be on an upward trajectory. And I think she is still trending up, but it's a, it's kind of leveled out more than you'd like. She still hasn't really figured out mixed. And I think she's way too predictable in women. So unless we see a real jump from her next week, I think Arizona's limited there. I, I have a, also a proposal here about Georgia Johnson's women's game. Uh, okay. I think, I think, should Georgia Johnson play the right side? Perhaps. She had a lot of success last year on the left side, especially when she was playing with, like, Vivian David and stuff. But this year, let's be honest, her women's results have been poor. She's have had a, She's inconsistent but has some good mixed results with JW. They're probably the most actually volatile mixed team out there just about right now. Um, but yeah, she should probably play on the right, but I'm not sure with Lauren Stratman. That's a, yeah, I, I, I think the Texas is a flawed team. Yeah. I just, Georgia keeps winning mixed matches with Travis Rettenmeyer and she keeps losing women's no matter who she plays with. It seems like these days, Lauren can play the left. Why not at least give that a try? It seems, seems maybe worth it at some point. That's fair. I also, just going back to Arizona, will we ever see Declabar like try to play like 70% of the court in mixed instead of like 90 most of the time? I, he should be able to, I, I, yeah, I think you're right. He just, he takes a little too much court mix. I don't know if he's considered taking a little bit less court. He, he played, and you know what? Playing on the right may kind of work for him in men's because he doesn't overextend himself. Uh, I, I think just playing a little less of the court could be helpful. No expert on pro pickleball strategy, but he finds himself on the like full side of the female, you know, more than just about anyone out there. So yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see him just change it up a little at some point. Okay. Group B Atlanta bouncers, Bay area breakers, DC pickleball team, Columbus sliders, the white castle team. What do you like? What do you not like? I still think DC is a really good team. Christian Elshon's gotten better. I, they're the best team in this group. I don't think it's that close. I think they're the best team in MLP. Yeah, I, I, I would still think if I had to pick one team to win, I'm picking them. Um, and then we have Columbus, Atlanta, and who's the other team in that group again? Bay Area. Bay Area. I guess I slightly like Bay. I think I like Bay Area as the second team out of that group. <laughs> I'm curious. Uh, I think that the King of the Court has been on uh, tomorrow, and they're going to talk about why Colin's bad at mix. But they played him primarily on the right and mixed. I think Megan Dizon had like a sickness as well. So they had Tina Pisnik the next day, but he, he has to play the right and mixed, but he, he keeps running around his backhand. So he's like taking more court than Deco Bar and mixed. It doesn't work. He can't do that. He has to be able to initiate with his backhand if he's going to play on the right and mixed. It doesn't work otherwise. Is Call John's going to retire from MLP to be a coach? Like, he would be such a specialist. Good. He's actually so smart. He should be a coach. He would be a really good coach. I would hire that Colin Johns as my coach. I don't know if I'd hire him to play on my team, though. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do you agree Bay Area probably? Or Yeah, I, I think I agree. I would go Bay Area and DC here. I, I would actually give. If Colin like, was just a little bit better at mix, Columbus is a frisky team. And if Simone was healthy, I think Atlanta looked better in the first event than their uh, winless record showed. But Simone's hurt. Colin can't play mixed. And he kind of doesn't play men's as well. We, he, not kind of. He doesn't play men's as well when he's not with Ben. So it doesn't quite work there. But yeah, I, I, just, I think J-Dub and Colin together, they're obviously a good men's team. But... 
is almost like too patient for the other team. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think Bay Area would be a guarantee. They're not a guarantee to get out, but I would have to have to favor them out of the group. Group C, Brooklyn Aces, Dallas, Miami, uh, Utah, Black Diamonds. What do you think? It's Brooklyn, Miami, Dallas, and who? Utah. That's a more interesting group in terms of, I think that, I don't know, who do you have as the, do you have a clear favorite in that group? Oh, not really. Uh, I, I like, I probably like Miami as the slight favorite. I think Mary Brasha is definitely going to be an upgrade over Allison Harris. I think I'm not. Yeah, I, I think she actually is. I think she just will play a stronger women's and is just she's just more more seasoned. Uh, I think she's she's better. And Miami's just there's and Tyra's really, really good. She's taking a ton of court and she's so athletic. I think I think uh, I like Miami to come out of the group for sure. My, yeah, I, I, it's interesting. Wasn't big on Miami. I think Tyra has made the jump. Like I wasn't big on Miami heading into the year. I think Tyra has made the jump. The Fed Tyson thing's kind of working, and it does give you two men that are strong mixed players, which is always helpful um i'm not a hundred percent sold on the uh mary brosh as an upgrade on allison harris i'm i think there's a decent chance but i think in doubles it's debatable especially actually i'm not sure in mixed but we have seen fed and mary have some good mixed results in the past I think Allison had a had a uh, up and down MLP. She got smoked some matches, just looked totally out of place. When, and then some matches she was right in. But I, I think just the I think you're gonna get a more steady level from Mary. It'll just be like you know what you're gonna get at least from match to match. It's she's probably not gonna get hammered the way Allison did in a couple of the matches. Do you have Utah as your second team out of this bracket, or who do you have? Which paddles do Irina and Annalie get to use? Stock um, paddle tech paddles. <laughs> I I think it's going to be real close. I I like I want to think that Dallas is going to be better than what they showed. And Dallas beat Utah in their la- like Utah had to win. Dallas was playing for nothing, and they they went out and took down Utah. I I don't know the the men's thing isn't really figured out between Ignatowicz and Jay DeVillier. I, I kind of like Dallas a little bit more, but that might just because I, my predetermined outcome from the team post draft, I, I like them a little bit more. Uh, I yeah. Don't... I just, I, I, Jay DeVillier is a tough fit in MLP because he plays like an alpha men style. Well, he needs to be like your second guy. Uh, yeah, I uh, Dallas. I think we may have just overrated heading into the season, as my take. Yeah, well, I think what was a little more concerning was that Ignatowicz and Elise Jones didn't look that good as a mixed team together. Yeah, you need that to be a high end mixed team, and they. Weren't. I think. Yeah, I think that's a problem. Is you kind of have like two higher end number two mixed teams right now. If they don't start with one of them, doesn't start playing a little bit better, and you need one of them to be a number one mixed team. I do wonder if part of that is James actually doesn't have a lot of experience playing with like kind of the more old school women's mix player like Elise, who is just literally going to play defense and reset all day. Like, yeah, you know yeah. Good point. But maybe James, now that he's serving like 100 miles an hour, if that paddle's allowed in MLP, will be able to make them a number one mix team. That serve was looking hot in Vegas, and if he can bring that, that that that's a game changing serve. If you can bring that to the table, for sure. Well, De- Deckel was causing just major issues with with his serve. He's serving the crap out of the ball right now. 
Yeah, and I think, again, the height of Pete Men's serve, I'm not saying any are legal, but it's going to start getting scrutinized again with guys really going for those serves. Yeah, I mean, if they don't call it illegal, it's not illegal. It just looks illegal to everyone who's watching. So I, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Brooklyn, I don't think Brooklyn is. We'll see. But I don't think their men are good enough. I don't think. No. Catch. And then I don't know what Andrea Coop is at this stage in her career. She's fine. But, you know, they, 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 I, I don't see them getting out of the group. No, I'm, yeah. Okay, you want to do you want qu- we'll go quickly through challenger. I don't think people care about challenger as much as we do, but let's quickly go through it. Uh, Florida, Frisco, New Jersey, and the St. Louis Shock. You know what? Frisco is frisky for its first uh, like W of the year, I think here. I think they're getting the W. I don't know if they're getting out of the group. I think uh, the fives and the the shock are probably I think the shock if, if Rob Nunnery can't go one and five again I don't think he's going to I think at least he and Emmerich are are too good of a men's team to uh, yeah I, he and Emmerich can't have to be winning matches like Martin's continuing to improve it's Rob can play the laugh Martin's obviously a good right side player like they should be doing better than that yeah uh I I think Florida is not good. I think Frisco had played two Dream Breakers. They were, they were close to getting a win. They, I wouldn't yeah, be shocked. Well, if they uh, got- I, I've got Frisco, even though I kind of predicted they uh, before the season that they could go winless again. I got them getting a win over Florida. So that's my big uh, prediction for that group. Okay, New Jersey, St. Louis leaving. Do you agree there? Yeah, I think that I'd be kind of surprised if that isn't what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what the, I, I think this, I don't know what the group of death is. I see what you think. Okay. Las Vegas, Milwaukee, LA Mad Drops, New York Hustlers. Is that a group of death? I think that's tough. I think LA basically being able to recreate their team. Obviously we saw Vegas in the finals last time. Milwaukee's no pushover. Yeah, I think that's your group of deaths. I think New York will be better with Kelsey Grambo and for Sarah Ansbury. I, I didn't even realize until I was watching some back how, like you mentioned it, how badly she was moving, but she was moving like like grandma slow. Yeah, no, she wasn't moving well. New York's going to be tough. We like them actually heading into the first uh, like event. They didn't perform as well, but I still think, you know, when you've got Braverman there, Yates, like Yami's continuing to improve. If Kelsey kind of hits, they should be a solid team. Al Yates was doing, he was putting his hands up in the middle of a point because Ansbury wasn't going to the net. And then he turned to his bench and started yelling. <laughs> I don't That's think it gets retro, much worse. retro uh, Kyle Yates. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I, I think Las Vegas, you got to say Las Vegas is coming out. Milwaukee also overhauled because they they switched out two people. They took out Pesa and Krista Getcheva for the – who else did they put in there? Um, I can't – oh, Callan Dawson and Riley Bonner. I don't know. That's – yeah, I think, I think Las Vegas, and I like New York to come out over the Mad Drops. Yeah, bad drops are going to be frisky, though. Like, uh, they've got the best male player in the challenger. Yeah, and then Silstrom, if he's actually playing well, I just, I think he's a question mark. We just haven't really seen Andreas. If Andreas is in good form, I think they actually can make it out. Yeah, Sierra Gaten Leach also, I, I'll be curious to see how well she's moving, if she's moving better than Sarah Ansbury or not, but we'll see. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, and then Group C, I think I think it's a tough group as well. Austin, uh, BLQK, Seattle Pioneers, and uh, the reigning Challenger champion, SoCal Hard Eights. Is that is that a tougher group than Group B? I think Group B is tougher. There's- I think Group B is tougher. Like, yeah, 
I would grow group B as the tougher group there, but you have SoCal as the top team in that group. I think you have to say SoCal and then it's going to be, I don't think Austin is very good. They didn't make any changes. I don't think they'll be good again. Uh, BLQK, I think then it comes down to BLQK and, and Seattle to, to, to come out of it for this group. So I, 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 uh, Eric Paulette, he's in for Marshall Brown, maybe an upgrade in mixed, maybe not, maybe an upgrade in men's, maybe not. We'll see. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Eric's got a few good wins, but it'll be interesting to see him at this level in this format. Yeah, and Seattle didn't make any changes, but they looked good the last time. They were basically a Pat Smith missed overhead and the dream breaker away from getting to the finals. So Yeah, I slightly I, I like Seattle as the second team out in this group. Yeah, I, I think I like BLQK slightly. They're women, I think. I don't know why they didn't. Pre- they just didn't have a good run. And, like, Patina didn't have a good day in, in the quarterfinals. But I think she's a top three woman in the in challenger. Makes a big who's difference. Who's going to play the right and who's going to play the left in the men's for BLQK? I think, I, I don't know. That's going to be a weird thing because Scarpa always wants to be on the left. And Paulette seems to be a left. I don't know. I have only seen Paulette play mix, though. I haven't seen him play much men's. Okay. Or any men's, maybe. I've seen him play with some, I've seen some Warnick. He's in a lot of bad pickleball, too, videos. Yeah. Bad pickleball is a YouTube channel, not bad. Like, you're not saying he's playing bad pickleball. No, the, the YouTube channel, <laughs> okay. bad pickleball. Okay. Is SoCal going to repeat, Jer? I, I I would favor them. I don't think they're automatic. I think I'd had I think I'd go SoCal and Vegas still of the top two even after all the moves in Challenger. Yeah, I think those are just the I think they are the two best teams. And and they like especially SoCal, like they didn't like, it was very close to not making the finals. So uh just because you're favored doesn't mean you're gonna win. So I think I agree there. Okay, we got a few few smaller, smaller stories to hit. Uh, that we have not touched on in our time uh, in our time away. Nationals follows MLP Dallas, and Nationals is doing a new thing with scheduling that we heard they may or may not be toying with for for next year at PPA events. And what they're doing is that they're doing each round for the draws on one day. So like the round of 32 for all five pro brackets will be Wednesday, then the round of 16 on Thursday, then I think the round of eight on Friday, final four Saturday, championship Sunday. And so they're doing that. So you get one one round per day. And if you're playing in three events, you would play three rounds, uh, or sorry, yeah, you would play three three matches in the day. But otherwise, if you just have one event, you're, you're gonna play a maximum of one match a day. Uh, it's yeah, it's it's more of that tennis model, right? They're moving like that's more moving to that tennis model. I just I don't know if it works for pickleball when the tournaments are are five, you know, five draws, you know, whereas a tennis tournament, really, you you have your men's and that's it for the week, or you have your women's singles and that's for the week, at least what people are watching. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, you know, we can maybe we'll find out we love it. I think we both can sometimes just fall into the trap of liking what we know. I think for a few reasons, it might be too early for pickleball. One is we do, thanks to the new contracts, have a bunch of people that are now able to kind of be full time pickleball. But pickleball is still so new. It needs to be able to attract people, new pros. And I think it's the format that makes it really hard. And like, that's one of my issues. They've already been moving that way, but it's really hard for new pros to kind of be able to commit to playing that many days. So, and you don't know, or do you plan to just play Wednesday because you're going to lose? Like, I think that's an issue. I think it's good and bad for fans. Right now, fans can go and basically watch a whole day. Flip side of that is that you can now go and see different events. If I want to see it all in the same day, if I want to see some mixed men's and women's, I can see it. But 
at the same time, I think fans are really going to probably come for that last couple days or the finals. So you're probably going to have a lot of players just playing week in, week out in front of no crowds. You can say that's the way a lot of these things are, but probably not also great for new players building up a uh, reputation and new fans. Yeah, I, I also just think it makes it, I don't know, does <laughs> I think it makes it harder to like weird to keep track of that you're trying to keep track of five events a day. Uh, it obviously gets easier as the week goes along because there's less players I, there. Yeah, I think it's just further like kind of devaluing from the fans those early rounds is my kind of thought. Yeah, and, and the early rounds, I mean, on a normal day, you don't watch much of the early rounds. And so, you, you know, now you're going to see some more early round matches or are we are we just going to see the marquee players on the stream courts beating up on you know people that would be my thought we're mainly going to see the marquee players beating up on the lower players yeah we'll we'll see how it goes but uh, if they're looking to do that next year and, and who knows with all the merger how both sides feel about that but i i I'm hesitant to change, of course, but it, it does seem a little weird. Like it's different than tennis because you've got the five events that people do care about and watch, and, and you're, you know, you're asking people to follow that every single day, all five different brackets and draws, and tune in for that. So you have to get people used to it, and so you got to give it a little time to breathe. But it's going to be a bit weird to to, to start, I think, undoubtedly. For sure. Okay, uh, I think that, well, do you, I just thought it was funny, the PPA, they, they made up that finals event, uh, the, the PPA, I think they put it on the weekend, they were supposed to do the, uh, the, they were doing like the USA versus the world event, and that's, that's not happening anymore, so they, they added this like race to the final, you know, where they have the top eight people playing from each, each division and they're going to pick yeah. their partners and whatever. I just thought that was kind of funny that, uh, Did they, they brought make it... that up? are we sure about that or was that plan? I'm fairly confident. I think Pardo might've said on the kitchen that it was planned and they wish they'd advertised it, but I'm pretty sure. I thought there was stuff about, I don't think it is made up. I thought they'd been advertised, like not really advertising mm-hmm. it, but there was stuff about that earlier this year. Oh, maybe, maybe there was. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I'm not 100% confident, but I didn't. I actually thought that this was something that was happening. Okay. Well, either way, uh, if, if it is, then it'd be very odd to bring it up so late and be like, hey, look at the race for the finals. But, okay, so a couple things have come up. Uh, Brooks, Wiley, uh, MLP commissioner, and, and Pickle Pro Labs, they do their paddle testing. Uh, they, they released a bunch of data the last couple of days, uh, regarding deflection testing and the grit testing surface roughness in, uh, in Atlanta and the differences in, in what's like changed with paddles over the past, really the past, even just like six months, uh, the, the deflection there's, I think they, they showed a bell curve. There's far more paddles. They they set a certain average deflection force, and there's more paddles in the 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 illegal range as well as ones that are bordering that range of uh, of 50, what they've set at, which is still legal. And then they also for surface roughness, I think they they provided more margin for air. But if they were using USA pickleball standards, uh, Brooks had tweeted out today that 65% of the paddles would have would have failed uh usa pickleball standards for surface roughness at mlp so it wasn't that that number i think i I don't remember what the exact number was i probably should have written it down but it was 24 paddles failed deflection testing i think it was like 15 failed their surface roughness but that was with a bigger margin for air i i know we've talked quite a bit about the paddles we did on our last podcast but it's interesting they they've released the information i think and it's just more paddle companies are figuring out how to get close to the limits. People are playing, uh, people are more people are playing with poppier paddles and spinnier paddles. It, it creates a bit of a different game. And I know they're working on it. Brooks tweeted that they're working on it. 
and, and they're putting the standard in place. But for now, it does uh, it does make the game a little bit different, especially for people who who have those better paddles and some people who are not. For sure, and that's also why we're seeing more and more paddles pushing those limits, right? Because that's what players want. Yeah, well, I thought it was really interesting when Colin Johns on his uh, pickle pot appearance was saying that, you know, also the way the paddle technology is, it makes it easier for these tennis players to get good at the sport really quickly, but it also may make it harder for them to get to the very top level because they're not, uh, what they ha- how they can play to get to a certain level is... Uh, doesn't get you to the very top of the sport, which is like the dinking, the more nuanced, patient, soft game that they might not have to play. And that's, you know, you have all these paddles now. It, it does, like, it's certain barrier for entry for the talented racket sport people. It, it does make their lives a little easier, you know, for getting sure. into, yeah, a certain level. No, I thought that was a smart comment, and I hadn't really thought of that, but there's probably a fair amount of truth to that. Yeah. You have anything else on the paddles that... uh not really. I, just we know that limits are being pushed and they need better enforcement, which I guess to MLP's credit, they're trying. Yeah, they're, they're at least taking them on a play at their events. I think it's just like if you go, you play MLP Dallas and then you go to PPA, you know, it looks like different paddles are going to be used. People's paddles. I, I, I'm curious if less paddles are taken out at MLP because of now it's become public that these paddles are being taken out of play. So I wonder if there's going to be a little more caution exercise by players and, and manufacturers going into MLP so that it isn't this like 24 paddles were taken out for deflection at MLP, but zero at the PPA. So I, I think that might be different this time around, actually. Uh, I think last thing that I just wanted to mention was uh, APP switching to, uh, it sounds like APP switching to rally scoring for 2024. And no, uh, no back draw as well, except for first round losers. That's only in pro. I think that's. I, I'm not actually sure. I, I think it, we for pro is the only place we've heard about it because I think that's the pros don't care about what what happens to the amateur players, frankly. So <laughs> I, I it, there's there's not much behind this. We don't have that much info. It's interesting to see them switching to a model that's going to go rally scoring. You know, real short games, two of three. Same format, two of three to 11, except it's rally scoring uh, and no backdraw. That's pretty punitive uh, if you lose in the second round and you just have a bad couple games. So, uh, and I, 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 I'm just really curious what the purpose is behind that when there hasn't been a switch to a full switch to rally scoring. Yeah, I'm very curious as well what the rationale is for the switch. And yeah, it, maybe they think it's for tv but it's like you don't have like players so without a high-end product i don't see tv being the thing i'm curious maybe just trying to be different but yeah and i i the route yeah and rally scoring two of three to 11 is just quick i you know it's just it's not if it's three to five to 11 it's probably pretty similar i i thought it was actually interesting i know it's i'm this is just off my manual calculation, but I think for MLP, you know how you talked about like maybe they should just go to pure rally scoring instead of have the the 20, you got to score on your serve to win. I yeah. think in the premier division, there were only two match, like two games within matches. So not two matches, but like two actual games that were decided the other way. Um, if, if you would like, the results would have changed if you had played the, the, the the pure rally scoring there's only two matches I, I thought it would be more but it was actually, i would have thought as well yeah so I, I, you know i i actually don't know i wonder how much difference it actually makes that's just one sample size you yeah i just would have thought it would have been more intuitively for sure uh okay well you got anything else for now that's yet? all i had girlfriend all, corner okay. we got girlfriend corner girlfriend corner's back uh, people have been asking for it. So you got to come in here. This is again, this is producer Alyssa and my girlfriend. Uh, and so we've got, uh, we've got, we've got to take one news piece of news. We didn't talk about Jer was, uh, the ranchers having some new owner owners to their ownership group. Lil Wayne is a strategic advisor 
So you had some thoughts on Lil Wayne being a strategic advisor for the Texas Ranchers pickleball team. Looking forward to this. It's gotta be close to the mic. Of all the people that, that they could pick, why was it Lil Wayne? Just why? He wanted in what? on pickleball. But what is he advising on? He knew what was like big in 2010. Creative endeavors and uh, I think apparel collaborations, yeah. what he's advising on. Some of us were going to the club and have nostalgia around Lil Wayne. I think Alyssa, some of us older folks. And some of us were in middle school when Lil Wayne was a thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what do so do you think it is like Lil Wayne is a big name, and he's I think he's still a big name. Like he's he's a big enough name, isn't he? I guess. Well, do you, but what has he done in the last like 10, 15 years? Jer, has he done that much? No, I guess not. I, it's funny because I saw that and I just thought it was another big name. I hadn't thought of him as being washed, but I guess I am old and washed myself. <laughs> <laughs> not not with that suit jacket on, Jer. That outfit. You're no, not looking you're old. looking sharp. <laughs> way, to, way to show the outfit to the to the audience. But I, I think like the it's I just thought it was interesting that they brought him in not just as another ownership name, like they actually brought him in as like he's allegedly like doing stuff for the team, which is not the case for for most of these big names. I think they announced Kid Leroy and uh, who is more relevant. Yes, but I think isn't he just like an owner? Or yeah, yeah, he's not like an advisor in any Maybe capacity. Maybe they got a good deal. Who? The ranchers on Little Wayne. You know there's no money in pickleball. <laughs> Wait, no money quite yet. Yet. Well, the valuations of the teams are skyrocketing. So. I stand by my point. They got a good deal. So you're saying you're out on Lil Wayne as a strategic advisor. Prove me wrong, Lil Wayne. Prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. No Lil Wayne. We'll see what Lil Wayne's got to offer. Maybe Lil Wayne will uh, go, go check. Maybe Lil Wayne will fix the jerseys. <laughs> who would Alyssa like to see as a strategic advisor? Who is hip with the kids these days? I don't know. Young Gravy? No. No. <laughs> no? I don't know. I just, the last person I think of is Little Wayne. I mean, who's who's in right now? Taylor Swift is in. Taylor Swift. Let's get Taylor Swift on the pickleball. He's too busy at the Chiefs games. Yeah, she is too busy. Maybe we got to get, Patrick Mahomes is into pickleball. Maybe we can get him in. And then Brittany Mahomes can get. She's hanging out with Taylor, isn't she? Yeah, she is. Yeah. I think this is we can't get Jackson Mahomes in on pickleball, so maybe just stay out of that realm. Poor, poor Jackson Mahomes, he gets he gets a tough ride. I don't know if it is. I believe he uh, it sexually assaulted a woman last year, so I don't know if he does get a tough ride. I, I actually didn't know that. So that's... maybe a retraction there, Chris. Good information to have. Yikes. Okay. Taylor Swift. It was on video too, so it's. Pardon? It was on video too, so it's tough to defend. Okay. Well, Taylor Swift is in. Lil Wayne, he might be out. So that's is that girlfriend corner for the week. That's girlfriend. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for for watching or listening. Uh, if you're not on YouTube, uh, vlog. Be probably picking up a little bit more as we've got more events coming up. Uh, we also, uh, you can also subscribe uh, on YouTube, uh, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and follow us on our socials, NML Pickleball. Check out our sponsors, uh, Drop Shot District Clothing and uh, One Shot Pickleball. And yeah, thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you next time. See you soon.